Moroni chapter 10 represents a thousand years of Nephite gospel teaching, the essence of a thousand years of Nephite gospel teachers compacted into one brief chapter in which he tells us, first of all, how to get a testimony, Moroni 10, 1 through 4. And then, secondly, he tells the posture of a Latter-day Saint, Moroni 10 and 5, and by the power of the Holy Ghost you can know the truth of all things. And then from that point he goes on to talk about life, and he deals then with the gifts, indicating that they come by the Spirit of Christ, and that's by the Spirit of Christ through that person we call the Holy Ghost. And then John exhorts us concerning the gifts and makes it clear that you don't do any good unless you work by the gifts and the power of God. Note how he puts it. Woe be unto the children of men. This be the case if there's no gifts. For there shall none be none that doeth good among you, no, not one, for there is if there be one among you that doeth good, he will work by the power and the gifts of God. Now, it takes the power and the gifts of God to move people toward the celestial kingdom. Unless that power and those power, uh, power and gifts are operative, then uh, you're doing a terrestrial kind of work. There's what I would call uh, three levels of work. There's telestial work. That is the work of injustice that's involved in perpetrating dissipation. It's great acting on the stage and before the television camera and in the movies being dissipation. It's good works telestially. The telestial are the liars, the perverters, the murders, the whoremongers, see. Now, the modern media in is by and large geared to that level. Even the PG things are geared to that level. Okay? Now, there's terrestrial good. Terrestrial good is the kind of good that an author would do. Terrestrial people are honorable. They're moral. They're decent. The Reader's Digest is a terrestrial document, by and large. It's got some good stuff in it. We take it. We subscribe to it. But you can read every issue of the Reader's Digest. If that's all you had, you'd never make it to the Celestial Kingdom. It's honorable. It's moral. It's good but it's terrestrial. What does it lack? It isn't the, the decency there. The thing it lacks is the power of God. Now that kind of work that brings a person to Christ and ultimately to the celestial kingdom and exaltation therein is the kind of work when a person works and the power. And that power touches the lives of people. It's not just that it's a moral principle and a good thing. It's a transforming principle. It's a revelatory principle. It changes. It builds a new creature celestial in character into the soul of those who receive it. That is celestial. I want to talk about enduring to the end talking about enduring on that basis and enduring the crosses of the world and the snide of the world and all of that that levels of bombardment against one who would have this higher life because this higher life is to the world and uh, even as Christ was alien to the world. See? Now he teaches us that. 
And then he comes now to the final great conclusion of this whole Nephite scripture, the latter verses. And note now what he's talking about. Verse 30, And again I will resort you that you would come unto Christ and lay hold upon every good gift. So you send your attention on the gifts and the blessings of the Spirit and the truths, the things that he can give. And then in verse 32, Yea, come unto Christ and be perfected in him. Now, don't just be perfected in his truth and by his light and his power. Be perfected in him. There is an indwelling relationship without which there is no eternal life, without which there is no celestial As Paul says, if Christ be not in you, then ye are reprobates. Now, there's an indwelling relationship. And so he comes to that, and that's the final thousand years of Nephite teaching, the essence of it. Come unto Christ and be perfected in him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness and love God, might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you. Under those conditions and circumstances, his grace is sufficient for you. That by his grace, perfect in Christ. Now there's an indwelling principle there again mentioned. You see that? Don't let that one go until you find out what it means. Now he goes on and says, and if by the grace of God, Ye are perfect in Christ. Ye can in no wise deny the power of God. Because if you had this kind and attained to this kind of relationship, then you have to know that power has animated your soul and filled your life, transformed your whole being and personality and character, and you cannot, under those circumstances, deny that power which has brought those results. And then he goes on to say in verse 33, and again, if by the grace, if ye by the grace of God are perfect in Christ and deny not his power, then are ye sanctified in Christ by the grace of God through the shedding of which is in the covenant of the Father unto the remission of your sins that ye become holy without spot. Now, enduring to the end is getting that. And that and get into it and have him into us and then endure in righteousness, we will never make it to the celestial kingdom. Now, that's why what Helen May said is so very important. Enduring to the end is a casual thing and in church. There are a lot of social Mormons who go through the social rat race because of social things. This goes deeper than that. You've got to be perfected in Christ, sanctified in Christ, and partake of his grace and his power, and endure in that relationship, and develop and blossom and bloom in that relationship. Now, let me see if we can see what that means, okay? John chapter 17, in this great high priestly prayer, that Jesus uttered just before going to Gethsemane and to crucifixion, he expresses the great ultimate desire of his life and soul as they relate to the gospel. And uh, I'd like to have you take a second look at some of the things that he said. We use the scripture I'm going to refer to here rather did it that but uh, there's a meaning in there that we just don't grasp and we'd like to have you see it. He's talking about those then who receive him. In verse 20, he says this, Neither pray I for them, that is, the immediate disciples about him, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now note, that they may all be one. Father art in me, 
and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may know that thou hast sent me. Now, when we get that relationship, we will have to say that, that Christ is real, because you don't get that just by building churches and chapels and being a happy people. This is, a, this is something that goes beyond that for which there is no human for it to exist. And when this is done, then the world will believe that the Latter-day Saints are the children of Christ. And then he says in explanation, And the glory which thou gavest me, now it gets to the divine glory, I have given them, now why? That they may be one even as we are one. Then he amplifies and explains, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Now let me come to the chalkboard here for a minute, and let's see right sacred writing, and uh, see if we can get uh, the idea of what uh, this scripture is saying. In order to, to get to it, let me just uh, suggest that we... Here is the Father, and I'm just going to put a circle there. This is the Father, the man of holiness. And he's a tangible being, as Joseph Smith said, in the doctrine that comes with the body of flesh and bones as tangible as man. Of course, it's not a mortal a spiritual body. And then... Here's Christ coming then from something less than the complete fullness of the Father, but eventually achieving a relationship where in the divine of truth and power, and this, uh, this is like a, a billion volts of power and energy uh, extending from the Father to dwell in Christ. And this power then is spirit, it's glory, it's intelligence, it's, it's life, the kind of life that's eternal life. Joseph Smith uses the word mind, not the mind, and so on. And it dwells, the Father extends to Christ, and then by Christ's consecration back to the Father, and by the reciprocal action of that glory and spirit, it comes back to the Father. So it is like a huge electrical circuit source of power here, being here, uh, and then extending to Christ and coming back. But it's not electricity. It's this essence and substance and power we call the Spirit. It's with it, the properties of the Spirit, intelligence, the gifts, the fruits, the love of God, all of those things, see? And this dwells fully from the Father into Christ and then flows back. All right, now what the Savior is saying is that he'd like to take that relationship and extend it on one more circle. And so you take man from somewhere down here, and let's suppose that he gets up here in the celestial state, and through the atonement that Christ made, paying the debt of justice, descending below all things, acquiring the fullness of the Father, and developing that fullness in him through his obedience and, and the atonement which he made, then he has the right through that atonement to extend that same glory to man. And then he expects us to be on a consecrated plane so that uh, there's an return flow and the Spirit can flow from here in us and return back and be a revelatory power in us, and to be a reporting and revelatory power in, in him, see? And so, as he says now, an explanation, and the glory to which thou gavest me, I have given them. Now, that's what the gospel is all about. It's not just remitting personal sins. That's the preparatory gospel. The remitting of sins is the preparatory, the everlasting gospel. Get this thing wired up, get this program on the show, or the show on the road, you see, and begin to build those spiritual powers and extend them. So he says, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, 
they may be one, even as we are one. Now, how is the Father and the Son one in unity and purpose? Yes, but that's, that's only part of the ball game. They're one, then, in the sense of glory and power and the reciprocal relationship of divine intelligence and all of its revelatory powers and gifts and fullness of truth and light. And when Jesus came up to the fullness of that, he, give, he was given all power in heaven and on earth, see? That's how you get all power. That's how you get power. It's by and through that process. On that point, let me turn to section 88 with you just a little bit, beginning with verse 66. The Lord uh, uh, is talking about this point, and, uh, and he says, Behold, here is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And this is a wilderness cry. There's not too many people in good old snowflake who are listening. It's out in the wilderness. He says, in the wilderness, because you cannot see him, my voice, because my spirit, it's not just sound waves, it's the powers of the spirit flowing into our lives. He says, my spirit is truth, truth abideth and hath no end, and if it be in you, it will abound. Abound means it's, it's going to actively manifest itself. And he says, and if your eye be single to my glory, your whole bodies shall be filled with light, and there shall be no darkness in you, and that body which is filled comprehends all things. All right, so Jesus came up to a relationship where his eye was single, the full glory finally dwelt in him, he had all power in heaven and earth, and then through his atonement he wants to bring the standard. You see that? And so he says then, the glory which thou hast given me, I have given them, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and thou in me. I in them, and thou in me. He says that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me. Now, if you want to understand what that means, the best place I know to go to look and to study is that sacred chapter in 3 Nephi 19. That is the best statement scripturally that really tells us what that statement is all about, and hence it tells us what the gospel is all about. The basis of Moroni's last great statements on being perfected in Christ and sanctified in Christ. Now read those statements in light of 3 Nephi 19. As I said the other day, Nephi 19, I like to call the Holy of Holies of the Book of Mormon because it represents a historical event which to me is the most sacred that uh, is recorded in the Book of Mormon. The report of Christ's second day's ministry among the Nephites. And to begin the day, then, they, they wanted the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost. They wanted to, they'd been members, they were faithful members in all this adversity. They didn't have some of these upreaching programs and blessings of the Spirit to the extent now that Jesus wanted them to have it. And uh, when they were going to build their Zion, they had this higher plane. And that's why, as we said last evening, the saints have got to be sanctified, the faithful have got to be sanctified. And the faithful have got to be subjected to adversity. And the faithful have got to be purified and go through the ref Malachi, knowing that, therefore says, But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appears? Because when he comes, he's going to be a refiner's fire like pure, fuller soap, and he's going to purify and purge them. Not just the dullards in the midst of the saints, but the, the righteous people, he's going to purge them and refine them as gold and silver. And he's got to do that in order to give the higher and spirit that Nephi saw in vision the faithful would receive. See? Now, 3 Nephi 19, then, gives us the key to that, and it's on this basis, and then enduring to the end on this basis that you really get into the gospel program. And so they met together. They prayed for the Holy Ghost. Verse 9 they desired then the Holy Ghost should be given unto them. 
And when they had thus prayed, they went down into the water, and Nephi then, their prophet, began to baptize the twelve, eleven disciples, all baptized. Then the record says, Behold, uh, came to pass when they were all baptized and come up out of the water, the Holy Ghost did fall upon them, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And behold, they were in were by fire, and it came down from heaven, and the multitude did witness it, and did bear record, and the angels did come down out of heaven and minister to them. It came to pass that while the angels were ministering to them, behold, Jesus came and stood in the midst and ministered unto them. And his second day's appearance under those circumstances. The first day he descended out of heaven. The second day it was in the midst of these divine manifestations. And then follows that beautiful that beautiful experience where he now asks John 17 and tells us and literally shows us what the gospel is all about. It says uh, uh, here, for example, in uh, 3 and now Jesus, uh, let's go back, for example, to verse 22. Father, thou hast given them the Holy Ghost because they believe in me. And thou seest that they believe in me because thou hearest them. And they pray unto me. And they pray unto me because I am with them. Now the Father knew that. Uh, but we didn't know it. And so Jesus said it to the Father for our benefit as to why. It says, Now, Father, I pray unto thee for them, and also for all those shall you believe on their words. And that gets right down here to us in our day and to our time. That they may be leave in me, be in them. Now, here's this indwelling thing. That I may be in them as thou, Father, art in me, that we may be one. Now, oneness comes by the of Christ's glory and power. It doesn't come merely by saying, rah, 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 get on the bandwagon, be one in unity and purpose. Now, fine, be one in unity and purpose, but no human process, including a speaking system where you can just blast rah, 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 is going to bring unity and purpose. You see eye to eye because you are in Christ and someone else is in Christ and he is in you and he is in someone else and then you come forth with that unity that the gospel requires and the scriptures indicate will come to pass. You see that? All right, so he's praying then. And then in verse 24, and it came to pass that when Jesus had thus prayed unto the Father, he came unto his disciples and continued without ceasing to pray unto him. And they did not multiply words, for it was given to them what they should pray, and they were filled with desire. They had a relationship now that was very intimate, addressing Christ because of his immediate presence and person. And it came to pass that Jesus blessed them, and as he prayed, as they prayed unto him, and his countenance did smile upon them, and the light of his countenance did shine upon them, and behold, they were as white as the countenance and also the garments of Jesus. Now was from him? On what principle did they become as white as the countenance and also the garments of Jesus? Just because they smiled? Now, I don't mean to be sacrilegious. I just want to make sure that we get the idea. They were white as his countenance and their garments were as his because the powers of the Holy Spirit were there. Okay? And he says, And behold, the whiteness thereof did exceed all, even there could be nothing upon earth so white as the whiteness thereof. And Jesus said to them, Pray on, nevertheless, they did not cease. And then the Savior expresses this idea further now, this sacred relationship. And again, we're not talking about theological principles and beliefs and concepts. We're talking about the gospel as a system of regenerating truth and power that can fill me and literally transform me and make me a new creature. There were occasions when the prophet, for example, was so filled with the Spirit in the evening when they had only the, the candlelight on the hearthstone where the light in his person radiated with more brilliance than the candle on the hearth. In that great experience in Sidney Rigdon for about two hours, 
beheld the vision of eternity, a one hundredth part of which only they wrote in section 76. The prophet Joseph's clothing dark in color became a brilliant light, and they sat in the midst of glory so powerful that the very clothing they had was transformed. The prophet appeared as though he was as strong as a lion, just vibrant with the powers that filled him. Sidney Rigdon was slumped down, looked like a dish rag. He was just slumped down and weak under the power, and Joseph looked at him and said, Brother Sidney, just like I am. All right, now there's, that's the kind of thing. Now this kind of experience happened on that occasion. Now note how in that context, now the Savior then prays. Uh, heaven, he returned away from them again and went a little way off and bowed himself to the earth and he prayed again unto the Father saying, Father, I thank thee that thou hast purified those whom I have chosen because and I pray for them, and I also pray for them who shall believe on their words that they may be purified in me. Now note this indwelling thing. Through their faith on their words, even as they are purified in me. Father, for the world. Now here he's coming right back to that great high priestly prayer in John 17. Father, I pray not for the world, but for those whom thou hast given me out of the world because of their faith, that they may be purified in me. Now note that I may be in them as thou, Father, art in me, that we may be one, that I may be glorified in them. And when Jesus had spoken these words, he gave the disciples. Behold, they did pray steadfastly. And then he talks about the whiteness and so forth again. All right, now, this is a visual aid. This is a demonstration of what this all means. And it's also a demonstration of what the gospel should be. If I'm going to get into the gospel program, I've got to plant the seed of faith. I've got to cultivate that seed so that that desire matures into hope. Desire plus assurance, which assurance comes by the witness and the strength of the spirit that that desire is right. And I testify to you that desire is right to come to Christ in the right way. And if you'll act upon it, then you come to faith and there's an enlightenment of mind. And that enlightenment of mind is real. As Alma says, is this not real? Yea, I say unto you it's real because it's light. And whatsoever is light is discernible. And it's good, and it's wholesome, and it doesn't displace your natural, your personality, and your unique qualifications and, and uh, character. It cleanses, sanctifies, and the Spirit begins to dwell within us. And as it dwells within us, then we are perfected in Christ. And as we are perfected in Christ and says, and know it. And it's a part of our lives, and we know that the powers of the Spirit are there. Then we cannot deny the power of God. And then if we don't deny that power and move in this program, then you're sanctified and perfected in Him, see. And then you endure in that positive posture, enjoying the fruits of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the revelations, the meekness of Christ and the strength of life and endure to the end. And if you do that, you shall have eternal life. Now, this great program actually began in pre-earth life. I want to talk about it in that sense. Uh, King Benjamin challenges us here in chapter 5. Uh, he challenged his people in his day, to be more specific, uh, to receive this program and to endure faithfully. And here, verse 12, I say unto you, I would that you should remember and re retain the name, uh, and retain the name written always in your hearts, that ye are not uh, found on the left hand of God, but that your heart 
hear and know the voice by which ye shall be called and also the name by which ye shall be called. And then on that basis then, having taken upon themselves the name of Christ, he said, therefore I would, this is verse 15, that ye should be steadfast and immovable, abounding in good works, that Christ the Lord God omnipotent may seal you his, that ye may be brought to heaven, that ye may have everlasting salvation and eternal life through the wisdom and power and justice and mercy who created all things in heaven and in earth, who is God above all. All right, so that great challenge now. Uh, as I said, this began in pre-earth life. In pre-earth life, there was a great development of our Father in Heaven spirit children. If you read the third and the fourth chapter of the book of, of Abraham, you'll find that there were those who were noble and great that among all the intelligences or organizations whom Abraham saw, he beheld the spotlight centered on many who were noble and great. And then he saw one among them who was like unto God. And I suspect that then is the only begotten. And he said to those who were with him, we will go down, we now, not just me, but we will go down. And we will take of these materials and we will create an earth whereupon these of spirits may dwell. And then as it talks about the war in heaven, briefly, and some important insights, it finally gets to the creation story in the first chapter of Abraham 4. And it says, and so he said, let us go down. And so they, that is the gods, went down. Now who were the gods? They were the noble and great ones. Some people have the idea that uh, eternal marriage is the only godhood. And they get the idea that the power of eternal increase is the primary thing that makes you a god. Now, I hate to disillusion you, but that is not true. Eternal marriage relationship is a subordinate correlated, not, however, the primary thing that makes exalted beings, gods. The primary thing is the divine. Godhood doesn't center in the procreative processes. Godhood centers in the mind and in the soul. And the procreative processes are subordinate to, with, subordinate to. Godhood centers then in the mind and in the soul. You become a son of God by receiving the divine powers and attributes. In, in D&C 39, I won't take time to turn to it, to as many as received him, gave he power to become his son. And then he goes on and says, and unto as many who shall receive me, I will become my sons. Now you have to receive power. And the person then who receives the Spirit of the Lord, which is power, and is transformed by faith and righteousness, puts off the natural man, and God, even a son of Jesus Christ, see? And he's in a father, in a son and the father relationship. Now it's possible then for those who become sons and daughters to grow up in Christ, to become fathers under Christ just like it's possible for a person physically who's a son to go out and find some cute gal and sidle up to her and says, wilt thou, and have her wilt, and then go and get the interview with the bishop to see if he's fit to be and then to go commit matrimony and begin doing the natural things and have the little ones come along and graduate from the level of being sons and daughters to being fathers and mothers. Now, that's, that's the story of the bugs and the bees, right? Now, you can... Thing. In rebirth, a person who is born again can come up to the standard of being fathers and mothers. Now, how do you do it? It's done through temple marriage. When you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then Abraham, under Christ, was the father of the faithful. 
All those who are born again from Abraham's down will be given to Abraham in the celestial family. I don't care what bloodline they're born in in the flesh, they all sons and daughters. And he becomes their father, see? Now, when we receive the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the temple, the thing that's important about temple marriage is it gives us the challenge and opportunity to become a father two ways and a mother two ways. The sense of multiplying and replenishing the earth physically, and the other in the sense of being a father spiritually of our children. And that can extend to others, see, so that your family in eternity uh, can extend beyond your physical family, just like eternity extends beyond his physical family, see. Or now, in that sense, then, you become sons of God by receiving these divine attributes. What do you become when you have the rights and the keys and the power to give these divine attributes under Christ and through Christ to others? What do you become? You become God's. You see that? And on what basis, then, are we exalted? Is it on the basis of physical or kids? There are a lot of unregenerated gods running around in Snowflake. <laughs> and along the Wasatch Front and in Alpine, where I live at the present time, there are a lot of them who are unregenerated. Procreation doesn't amount to godhood. Godhood is centered in the processes of rebirth and spiritual renewal and power. And uh, when a person then is given the keys to develop that power and light in someone else, then they become gods. Now, do they have to be perfect? No, they don't have to be perfect. They have to be in Christ, but they have to hold the keys. Let me give you an example of the prophet. He's talking here now about some scriptures relating to Moses. He says, Now the Lord said to Moses, Thou shalt be a god unto Aaron, and he shall be thy spokesman. Thou shalt be a god unto the children of Israel. And then the prophet comments and says, I believe those gods that God reveals as gods. And as a case in point now, he I believe those gods that God reveals of God to be sons of God who exalt themselves to be gods even from the foundation of the world. Now, Abraham was a god. So was Moses. So was Joseph. And so were others. You see that? On what basis? That they had received the divine nature, that they had the keys, that they developed those divine powers and gave them to others. And it was that body that created the earth under the direction of the only begotten who was the executive of the Father in those actions. You see that? Now, uh, that's it. So there are many great developments that took place. Now, at the time of development then, the prophet says, and he's talking now of a period after the war in heaven, he says, the Father called all spirits before him and organize them. He, Adam, is the head and was told to multiply. Now, when he talks about organizing them, he's not talking about organizing the human spirit, per se. He's uh, talking about organizing them in the sense that they were to come to this earth. As Paul says, God hath determined, uh, is made of one blood all nations of men to dwell upon the face of the earth, and has determined then the bounds of their habitation where, where and uh, under what circumstances they would come, see. And as Moses preached to the Israelites in, in Deuteronomy 32, he told them that there was a house of Israel in, in the pre-earth life, in the first estate, before they were on this earth. There were those then who came up to that standard and uh, were sanctified as spirits and attained that standard of spiritual life and excellency. And uh, there were others then who didn't come clear up to that standard. They didn't necessarily rebel from the war in heaven. They wandered around, but there were those that came up to that standard. And they became Israel by embracing 
on order of Zion as it pertained to the spirit world. And then of that group that came to that standard, and that's the standard you had to be in to become a son of perdition or a daughter of perdition, there were then a group that fell. And that's the third part, for those of you who had that question. That's the third part. One part, one unit of those who came up to that, those who came to that level and remained faithful, and then the rest who just didn't make it up into that area, which is the other part. You see that? And it's that relationship. But there were many then who came. Now, when the, when the, when the Father called us together and organized this, then this he calls the doctrine of election. The doctrine of election in the flesh. Now, the word elect merely means to appoint. Uh, Emma Smith was an elect lady, and when she was called to be Relief Society president, the prophet stood up and said that that election had now been fulfilled, that her appointment in the council of that sacred office, she therefore, being an elect lady, was now fulfilled. Now, in that pre-earth council, when the Father called all spirits before him and organized him, then according to Moses in Deuteronomy 32, he used the house of Israel as the basic unit, because the house of Israel is the unit through which salvation is going to be given. And then within that pre-earth house of Israel, then there were those who were more faithful than others. And so he spread that house of Israel then down through the ages. Now, he gave some of them to come through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and later on the children of Israel with Moses. And in, in this sense then at Mount Sinai, he gave them the opportunity to become Zion again in pre-earth life. And I want to talk about that in relation to Revelation 12 this evening. And uh, uh, so he used that as a basis. And then he selected others to come in the days of the Savior. And there were those in the house of Israel who were social climbers. Hammered to be on earth in Jerusalem when Jesus was there. They were great personalities, but their substance was deficient. And they clamored to come to earth when Jesus was there. And the Lord permitted them to come. And they, through their greatness of personality and character in some ways, attained a high office, and they were members of the Sanhedrin and all of that, and they got their fulfilled wishes. But they were all in their allegiance to Christ. Nicodemus was one of them, you see that? Gamaliel and all of those guys, see? And so they were proved. And so there's a te second testing that goes on. And then there were those, then the Lord uh, knew that he had to do the winding up program. And so there were those then who reserved to come to this earth in this dispensation. And there's two divisions of time in this dispensation which are most important time was Joseph the prophet and some of the noble and great ones came and then there's another period of time when the early saints having not really fulfilled all the requirements to build Zion the Lord is going to have to set his hand again the second time there's two second times and when he sets his hand again the second time and begins the marvelous work and a wonder, which will be the building, the transformation of society according to the pattern of Zion and the establishment of the new Jerusalem, then there were those who were reserved to come in that day. And among them there were many, not just but privates, and not just sergeants, and not just second lieutenants. There were many of the generals, and those generals are now on earth. Those generals are now on earth. And they are those who bore the heat of the day. They were those who endured the blasts and the bombardment power and the subtle insinuations of the adversary in the war in heaven, which was a power struggle, kind of like Joseph felt when he was in the 
sacred grove. It was a power struggle. Satan couldn't kill you, but both wish you were dead. And there were many who melted under the blast of his power and who fell away. And there were those then who sustained by their faith righteousness and endured. And it's this who endured faithfully then that the Lord is channeling to come to earth in our day. And when this whole scenario gets underway, which will have its expressions when uh, the Gentiles of the really ripe and so dissipated that they fall apart at the seams and the economy goes under and begins to rock and so forth, and the warfare against Zion begins, it will be those then who were the noble and great who will stand and they will and they will build the Zion of God on this land. And they will finally do what Moses didn't do and what others haven't done. They will finally do it. And that's what enduring means. Now, the prophet talks about this doctrine of election. Let me read it to you from the teachings, page 189. He says he spoke of the chapter of, on, on, the doctrine, on the subject of election and read the ninth chapter of Romans. Now, the whole ninth book of Romans deals with this doctrine. And the key statements in the ninth chapter are, is verse 4. If you understand verse 4, you understand uh, and, and have an insight into the gospel that uh, is certainly worthy of commendation. I was uh, teaching a D&C class on BYU campus, and I threw out this challenge. I said, are there any of you folks who can come into my office and explain to me Romans 9 and 4. And I mean explain it, not just get a few insights to it. Explain it to me of what it is saying. I will give you an A in this class in the final exam. I had a lot of noble return missionaries that tried, <laughs> but they never made it. They never made it. All right, he read the ninth chapter of Romans from which it was evident there spoken of was pertaining to the flesh. It's what was appointed and fulfilled in this life. Shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now he's quoting Romans 9 and 4, one feature of it. He says, to them belonged the adoption and the covenant. Now what's the adoption? Well, the adoption is the right to be born again and to become sons and daughters of Christ through the articles of adoption. All right, now what are the covenants in addition to the adoption? To them belong and the covenants. Now this centers in the house of the Lord and the program by which the holy endowment is ministered and by which you come from the level of sons and daughters to be fathers and mothers under Christ within the sacred See, If you're born in the flesh, in Abraham's posterity or seed, you have a legal right in the program of God to the adoption and to the covenants. You see that? Now he goes on and explains that. He says the election of the promised seed still continues down in our day. And in the last days they shall have the God, the priesthood restored to them. And they shall be saviors upon Mount Zion. He says the whole of the chapter had reference to the priesthood and unconditional election of uh, individuals to eternal life was not taught by the prophets. They never guaranteed anyone back in prayer life that they'd be in the celestial kingdom. There was no unconditional election back there. You have to come to earth, receive that faith, the blessings that are promised to you. And how do you know what they are? You're here in a state of forgetfulness. Now this is where what the prophet taught Brigham Young after the martyrdom, when the prophet appeared to him and said, now you follow the Spirit of the Lord. And if they'll follow the Spirit of the Lord, it will lead them just right. The Lord knows what you we were elected to receive, and if we respond and follow through, then His Spirit will guide, and it will open up avenues, and it will open up channels. And when we get through the process, that Spirit will lead us better than we could lead ourselves. And it will lead us to the fulfillment of promises, those rights and privileges 
that were appointed in pre-earth life that we talk about under the doctrine of election and as a part of that under the doctrine of foreordination. The foreordination program really refers more to promises. Election pertains to the whole house of Israel and the privileges we have as members in relation to the program of adoption and the temple and the rights related to that and to exalted life. See, that's election. All right? So then of enduring to the end began where? It began back there. And then you come to earth in a state of forgetfulness. And you're left then here to yourself. And if you follow after righteousness, and follow the Spirit of the Lord, then the Lord works in a cooperative way. The door is open, things are given unto you, and you finally come up by his guidance and direction to receive what you have foreordained or foreelected. And under those circumstances, then this great challenge of enduring to the end has a dimension that sometimes we don't think of. It isn't just a matter of receiving the gospel and then being faithful until you finally are conducted into the chapel by the pallbearers. That's not, that's not the issue. The issue is who you were in pre-earth life. What did the Lord appoint you to do? And have you the way that you have received that and have you built on that program and fulfilled your personal divine destiny on this earth? Now, the Lord told Abraham who he was. He knew the earth life, and he is no respecter of persons. He can tell us the same thing. He can tell us who we were in pre-earth life. And if we don't know who we were, then that's a part of the revelation of the I can't endure faithfully to the end unless I know what end I'm enduring to. And that end isn't just activity. That end then is in relation to my life and what the Lord wants me to do. You see that? Now that time of being called of God by prophecy. Now we identify that as a kind of a revelatory thing. You believe in called of God by prophecy. But called of God by prophecy is not just revelatory, it's real. Back there in pre earth life, when that council held and the organization was made, then Joseph Smith, for example, was appointed and selected to be the head of the dispensation. That was a prophetic event. Joseph, you will be head of the dispensation of the full on this earth. That was prophecy so far as that was concerned. See? If that same kind of thing is said to me in relation to something, then that is a prophetic event, and it's literal prophecy. And then when the comes under the direction of the prophet and the brethren and the stake presidency and the bishopric, and they say, hey, Brother Anders, I'd like you to be a bishop, or I'd like to be you a high council, or I'd like you to do something, then that call comes through the spirit of But it is a fulfillment of that prophetic situation that started back there, and hence, I am called of God by prophecy. And hence the more sure word of prophecy, as Joseph explained in section 131, then is for me to receive this thing to start with and then to be faithful in it and then to be so faithful that the Lord by revelation can say to me, you have received your foreordination for and you're a prayer for the election. And you have been faithful, and now I promise you that we're going to extend that and these blessings of fullness to that calling and fruition to that calling will be yours in the rest. Now that's what it means to endure to the end. That's what the gospel program of endurance means, see. It starts back there. It gets to be a situation of you learning who you were. I know who I was in life. And you can know who you were in pre-earth life. I know what the Lord wants me to do on earth. You can know what the Lord wants you to do on earth. My greatest desire in my life is because it's still a conditional thing for the Lord then to guide, direct, and finally fulfill what in that grand council in heaven he gave me as an assignment to fulfill.
challenge and great adversity and great faith. But I have hope that it will be fulfilled even yet. And in that sense, then, you can do the same thing. God is no respecter of persons. Let that same mind, which was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of man, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Know that you can be like Abraham. If he had the revelations given to him, know that you can. You can have those things. And it's when you go through this just mundane nuts and bolts thing and get to Christ and get committed, particularly the most important thing after Christ is his prophet. And in some way, his prophet is even more important because that's the mouthpiece on earth. And the president. And then, in patience, work through your salvation and ask the Lord to know who you are and what he wants you to do and make your decisions in this life on the basis that the Spirit of the Lord dictates those decisions, major decision, without the Lord knowing, uh, being consulted and counseled and telling you, confirming that this is what is the best thing for you in your life, see? And you'll finally then come to endure to the end and receive the thing that God would have you to receive. May the Lord bless us now, my brothers and sisters, to do this. This is nothing more than the standard gospel program to do so. But become alive to it and apply it and realize its blessings because they're real and they can be achieved and they can be attained. I tell you my witness that that is true and I so in the sacred name of Christ. Amen. Prophet Joseph. <laughs> I don't want to dare talk about the women. <laughs> Uh, God is plural, do you know that? God is male and female. Uh, in Genesis it says, let us make man in our own image. And so it says, they made man in their own image, male and female made they, so forth, see. God is male and female. It, in the celestial arithmetic, it takes two to make one. Is one in the celestial arithmetic. And uh, the female role of it is far more than just having spirit babies. You get a key to it in the temple, in the church program, which I like to liken to a construction crew. It's here to build the family of Christ. Paul says it's here to perfect the same and and all of that till we come to the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ and so forth. Now that fullness is given in the temple. And that fullness is only conferred on a man and a woman jointly. And in that fullness then, a woman becomes a queen and a priestess. And the temple tells you the key. In the church, women do not hold priesthood in this construction crew. In the house of the Lord, what's the case? They do, and they minister sacred priesthood ordinances, from the sacred initiatory ordinances on up to the giving of the sacred elements of the endowment. This is a pattern. This is a pattern. Uh, you know, women are always uh, burdened down with housekeeping and cooking and all And that's important. It's not important to the extent you should put your primary goal on that. It is important that you have a neat home because the spirit can dwell better there. But a woman then who meets that challenge condition goes on and becomes a mother in Israel, becomes a real Sarah, a mother in Israel, in the resurrection, there will be plenty of singles around to take care of the housework, the cooking, the tidying up. And a woman who has met that challenge of keeping a clean home of the general functions and then gone beyond it to become a mother in Israel, nurturing her children in the spirit and gifts and the powers of the Holy Ghost. 
and becoming a mother in that sense in eternity that will be hurt and she will not only nurture and administer but she will perform sacred temple rites just like the temple teaches us which is symbol of things to come see to womanhood than we teach generally just a whole lot more the third part being from the house of israel basically that's moses and that's not the third part from the house of israel there was a house of israel in heaven world before there was one here on earth now how do you become the house of israel you came there through your commitment to christ and through and through developing a spirit in the divine spiritual powers and gifts of the gospel see you came up to that level qualified you because you that qualified you to become perdition until you get to there you're not perdition so you don't have the capability to become perdition until you got that degree of light and truth but you came up then to that level where if you then rebelled then you became now there were those then who came up to that level and they became israel israel means prince of god or soldier of god and and uh, Moses teaches us that there was when the brethren have always taught that there was a house of Israel in the spirit world before there was one here. Now, when you come to that level, blessings of the spiritual endowments, and then you come out in open rebellion. And Lucifer was in that category, and he came out in open rebellion, and then he fell. And there were those who supported him, and the unit that fell was that unit that had been some in some measure sanctified and that was the third part it's not the fraction it's the third part now i'm not saying this officially i'm just brother andrews here uh giving you some in uh, i don't have any right to set church doctrine there's only one person has right to set church doctrine and that's the prophet of the church talmud didn't have that right bruce armor conkey didn't have that right uh Widso didn't have that right the only that church doctrine is the prophet saying i give you that as the best thinking and the best inspiration and you can buy it on that basis that i can that i know but i can bury my witness that the spirit of the lord has been with me it's a thought i can do that and you just take it from there referring to becoming a god before coming to the earth did you say that it depends on a person's ability to pass on divine nature explain this again please you become now that's true of the physical attributes isn't it you become a son or a daughter by receiving physical attributes from two parents and that makes you a kid or a son or a daughter and then when you go through those higher rites of marriage and so mothers and mothers then and give birth to children then you're their father and mother right all right now the same kind of thing happens in the gospel when you become sons you do so by receiving the powers now there were those in pre-earth life the noble and great ones who had held keys of priesthood and through whom christ working in and through them they extended his glory and his spirit and power to others and in that role then they became gods and are called gods you see that you become sons by fathers and gods by giving. It's just that simple, like falling off a log. Okay? Uh, another question now. How does our patriarchal blessings come into play in our pre-earth election and foreordination in this life? That's a good statement. Uh, your patriarchal blessing isn't a fortune. If I can give you a symbol, patriarchal blessing is like an anchor. Now, what does an anchor do for a boat? You kind of puts it over there and the boat can go around and here and moving that and where you are and what the Lord has for you but in that sense it's not a fortune it's a revelatory anchor of where you center your life and what you ought to do to fulfill to the greatest degree the election you had given in your pre-earth life okay and uh, it leaves you free and all of that but it gives you a, a buy to that and study that patriarchal blessing and then build on it by the spirit of the lord and the spirit of revelation to you if you talk about the spirit of the lord, revelation be a part of the gospel the greatest thing that it ought to give you is a knowledge of who you are and why you're here and not just a theology who am i who am i see the patriarchal blessing helps on that it's one means by which that knowledge begins to again unfold in your life see now there are others 
Is the baptism of fire the same as being born of the Spirit or born again? Somebody says that's a hard question because there's different levels of rebirth. The baptism of fire that the people of King Benjamin had was an upper echelon level. And the baptism of fire that the people of the Nephite all the trauma of opposition and persecution and then went through the cataclysmic events of Christ's crucifixion and then came out the other end and uh, as good faithful members of their prophet having had before that angel's visit I mean he didn't have to have the gospel taught to him again but the father the, the, the Savior gave them then the baptism of fire and if you will study the Book of Mormon Read, for example, 3rd Nephi 12, the verses 1, where, where it puts the baptism of fire as the basis of the Sermon on the And then read very carefully thereafter and all through the Book of Mormon. For example, here in 1st Nephi 11, and this is one of the looks of Nephi. He's, uh, now this is 3rd Nephi 12. He's talking about the three generations after Christ. And he says, he looked, and I looked, and beheld three generations pass away in righteousness. Now note what he says and their garments were white, even God. Now, it wasn't just the twelve disciples that got that baptism in 3 Nephi 19. The others got it. And the angel said unto me, These are made white in the blood of the Lamb because of their faith in him. And that was on this foundation that they built Zion. That's why the faithful saints have got to be purified, because we're not We've got to be purified. You can't endow Zion with a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night until you get on that basic foundation. That's part of the program. And that's one of the features of what we are living through in the ministry of President Ezra Taft Benson. Everyone thought he was going to talk on politics. And what has the man done? I've talked with his older son Reed on several occasions, spent hours with him. And the big trauma, the Lord told my father to talk on some politics. And I said, well, I'll tell you why. I think he's telling him what he wants him to do this time. He's, we all know the, uh, the, the political picture and the need to keep close to, to the foundations politically. This know what President Benson has done in his earlier life. A lot of people don't like it, but we know it. But we don't know very much about getting our lives sanctified like we ought to. And so the Lord has commanded him. And this was a revelation, believe me, to that man. You get to the Book of Mormon, and you learn its doctrines, and you get its power in your life, see? Now, when we come up to that full rebirth program that the Book of Mormon talks about, then we'll be out from under condemnation. Nations, because we haven't come to it. I haven't come to it, and you haven't come to it. And the whole church, in that sense, is less than what the Book of Mormon would have us be, see? You see that? And we're under condemnation according to the standard of true rebirth in we're under condemnation. And we need to awaken and get to that. And you can't build Zion until you sanctify the righteous. I'm not talking about the, the others. All right, what are the gospel blessings? Wow. I'm crucified in the fullness of Godhood. The fullness of the divine nature. Well, it's been a thrill. Hey, I'd, I'd like to just go right on here and talk on through till about 10 o'clock tonight. But we better let you go home and uh, we'll see you back at 6 this evening. We wanna, we're going to we're going to tackle Isaiah in the Book of Mormon. Let me just suggest to you that some of the most sacred and revelatory things are in the Book of Isaiah in the Book of Mormon. So come on back and we'll make an attack on that subject. And the Lord bless you.